detergent, insensitive, boiling insensitive, protease insensitive. Maybe it's just a very exceptionally hearty protein, you know, that's attached. Maybe it's um, the world's most hard to inactivate protein enzyme. So how do you really go about proving the opposite? Well, we decided that if we would turn to a way of making the RNA where the RNA had never been exposed to a tetrahymenous cell, would have no opportunity to uh, pick up a, a tightly adherent protein, um, and then if that RNA could still undergo this splicing reaction, that would be as good a proof as, as we could think of that the activity was intrinsic to the RNA as opposed to being due to some uh, other uh, component that was contaminating the, the, the solution. And so we had to learn what at that time was a fairly new area, which was the recombinant DNA manipulations. We cloned a portion of the tetrahymen ribosomal RNA gene uh, behind a promoter, which is a sequence that RNA polymerase sits down on and is a start site for making RNA. At the time, my wife was uh, working on research on E. coli RNA polymerase, so we had a familial source of, of the enzyme, mixed it together, made the RNA transcripts, and uh, purified away this one protein that we knew we had added, which was the E. coli RNA polymerase, uh, and then tested this uh, RNA for splicing. And in fact, it underwent cutting and rejoining at the same sites, and this was important, the same sites that were known to be the splice sites in vivo in the living organism. So this completely artificial reaction was now parroting what, ha what was happening in biology, and that uh, gave some uh, added uh, reason to believe that this, that this self-splicing reaction was of biological significance. We would have been quite happy to find that there was a, a protein involved. There was only one other laboratory in the world that was making much progress uh, purifying splicing enzymes. This was John Abelson's lab in Southern California. If we had been able to contribute to that, that would have been fine with us. We were lucky. It turned out there was something that was applauded much more generally in many different scientific fields that was waiting for us at the end of this, which was that RNA shares with protein the ability to catalyze biological reactions. So unknown to us when we announced this discovery, there was a whole group of people out there who were just waiting for it. They sort of knew that this would come at some point if they would only live long enough. Uh, this was another generation of scientists from my own, so I was, uh, perhaps I should be embarrassed, I was quite unaware that there had been rampant speculation about RNA as a catalyst in the mid-1960s, when I was still in high school. And as I said, I was, if anything, interested in rocks and stars and chemistry at the time, so I wasn't paying any attention to this at all. But Francis Crick, Leslie Orgel, um, Carl Woese, Alex Rich, among others, had written articles speculating about this chicken and the egg problem. How, you know, if contemporary biology requires nucleic acids as the informational molecule to pass on information from generation to generation, but nucleic acids are inert, they can't do anything without proteins. Most importantly and most fundamentally, they can't be copied into a, a a, a reproduced copy without protein enzymes, then how do you get things started if you need both the nucleic acid and the protein, sort of both the information and the function, to have even the most primitive of self-replicating systems? Well, maybe RNA can do both things. And, and why would they think about RNA rather than DNA? Well, because the ribosome, which is one of the most fundamental machines in all of cells, contains a lot of ribonucleic acid. And, you know, maybe that's telling us something. Maybe the uh, primordial ribosome was, in fact, uh, um, the RNA doing the, the catalysis. So maybe RNA is the answer to the chicken and the egg. In other words, at the beginning, there was RNA replicating itself, catalyzing its own reproduction. And then the proteins came along later, 
and then finally the DNA, uh, an important afterthought, but sort of an afterthought uh, because we all know that even in modern uh, biology there are viruses uh, such as the common cold virus, the common flu virus, that have a genome made of RNA. And their central dogma is just RNA makes protein, RNA makes protein. You don't even need to necessarily mess with DNA if you're a, if you're a small genome. The word ribozyme came out of a laboratory contest that I held for a name. When we were writing up this cell paper, I thought we ought to have something to call it other than just the tetrahymena self-splicing intron. Why did I think that we should have a name for it? Well, because I thought that there would be additional examples. I liked the ribozyme one because it was much broader, and I had a hunch that the examples would be far beyond just the uh, self-splicing RNA. And in fact, they now have gone much beyond that because in this fascinating uh, area called test tube evolution or in vitro evolution, scientists have been able to use artificial test tube evolution techniques to, to identify ribozymes that have a whole panoply of, of catalytic activities, far beyond what the natural ones do. And those are now called ribozymes as well. The next one was about a year later, and it was a very important one. Uh, Sidney Altman from Yale University, with whom I shared the Nobel Prize, uh, working with uh, Norm Pace in a collaboration uh, on a, an enzyme called ribonuclease P that uh, was an unusual enzyme because it had a, an RNA component and, and a protein component. And the two together are, appear to be required for activity in the living cell. But they found that under conditions of elevated salt, in the test tube that the RNA by itself had the catalytic activity. It was a, a processing reaction that cut off a leader sequence off of transfer RNA precursors. So that was important because uh, it was a, a true multiple turnover enzyme. It met, met the whole definition of catalysis. It wasn't just a self-rearranging RNA, but it was an RNA that worked on other molecules, cutting them and releasing them and being unchanged in the process. Then, within the next few years, many additional examples of self-splicing RNAs came to light, both ones that were structurally related to the tetrahymena example and ones that, were of, that established new structural and mechanistic categories. I remember um, one uh, researcher uh, from St. Louis uh, who was working on a yeast mitochondrial RNA, writing us very excitedly saying that uh, we repeated your experiments side by side with our own and it really does work, you know. And I, of course, he, he was very excited. I was slightly perturbed that he, you know, would even think that it might not work in his own hands, um, but he had gotten some materials from us as a positive control to run next to his own experiment and was able to reproduce our, our, our findings. Uh, so uh, there was a, another group in um, Amsterdam that uh, found several examples of uh, RNA catalysts. There was a um, woman in uh, Albany, New York, who, who found uh, bacterial examples. So it wasn't just in eukaryotes, organisms with a separate nucleus and cytoplasm, but also in, in bacteria. Uh, so it sort of exp it, it spread exponentially, and now there are more than 1,500 different examples, sequenced examples of catalytic RNAs in the database.